finally, after 12 years, we did it. We did it. This week in Pennsylvania, a new law bans handheld cell phones while behind the law, a law driven to completion by a grieving mother. The budget train is on the tracks at the Capitol. Democrats' crown jewel boosting public school funding moves in the state house, but will the Senate derail it? And why were policemen who guarded the U.S. Capitol on January 6th jeered when they came to our Capitol this week? We shall discuss. We'll also be joined by Congressman Dan Muser in just a moment. Hello and welcome to This Week in Pennsylvania. I'm Dennis Owens. We're covering hot topics in PA policy and politics, as well as the issues that are important to you and your family. Well, you remember a state court ruled that PA's public schools are unconstitutionally, inequitably funded. One report suggests 367 of the 500 districts don't get their fair share, and the cost to level them up? $5.1 billion more. Well, this week, House Democrats moved a school funding bill that steers $1.1 billion additional money to K-12 public schools next year, lots more in coming years. It also introduces charter school reforms and caps cyber charter tuition at $8,000 per year. The Senate still must weigh in, and it will. It's not the final product, but an historic, and supporters argue, necessary commitment to schools. Republicans want to know, though, that the money's being spent wisely. We're about to put forth more money than we ever have in terms of public education, and yet we still don't know exactly the metrics we're gonna to use to determine if this investment is successful. What are we going to measure as student achievement? Because if we're not talking about student achievement, what are we talking about? The courts said in the ruling that you can't get there without spending money. So any talk that we may hear about we don't need to invest in education is patently untrue, and let's be honest, nobody really believes that up here. Passed out of committee on party lines is expected to pass the full House on Monday, an important first step in budget negotiations. Again, the Senate, though, will have its say. Well, it has been 14 years since Paul Miller was killed by a distracted driver in the Poconos, and there's finally closure for his mother, Eileen, who vowed to make a difference. She's pushed a handheld cell phone ban for a dozen years. It is now law signed by Governor Shapiro this week, but it will be a slow rollout so that drivers can be educated about the new rules. It does not take effect until a year from now, June 2025. For the first year after that, drivers who violate it can only be given a written warning. A year after that, in June of 2026, $50 fines with no points will go into effect. But drivers shouldn't wait just because there's no fine. Doesn't mean it's fine to hold the device behind the wheel. That phone call could wait. Pull over. There's no reason why somebody should die because of a phone call, a text, a Snapchat. There's nothing so important. Pull over. Hands-free devices are still legal under that new law. A news flash, a big election is less than five months away. News tip, nearly everything that happens from now until Election Day is politically motivated and calculated, like President Biden's Secretary of Transportation, and former presidential candidate Pete Buttigieg visit to Pennsylvania this week, checking out a steel mill in Steelton that creates train tracks used across the U.S. and touting Biden's job creation. President and vice president were here the week before. They will no doubt be back. Governor Shapiro, a likely presidential candidate at some point himself, escorted Buttigieg at the steel mill. And my colleague Seth Kaplan asked them what lots of people were thinking. I can't help myself. Strikes me that I, I'm looking at two possible very early front runners for the 2028 Democratic nomination. So, and I'm not going to answer, ask you a question I know you're not going to answer, but just wondering if you could talk about how what you're doing today matters for whatever everybody's future ambitions might be. Well, all I can say is that any job I've ever had, I've known the most important thing is to do that job well. And uh, what we have right now is a moment on our hands where the president has asked our department to deliver uh, a level of investment that has not happened in my lifetime. That's taking roughly 110. Shapiro shook his head at the question, didn't answer it, but did say it's important for Pennsylvania that Biden be reelected. Here at This Week in Pennsylvania, we've embarked on a year long project to increase voter participation. And we apparently have a lot of work to do. Official numbers are now out from the Department of State showing just 23.8% of registered voters bothered to cast a ballot in the April primary. 
Voter rolls in Pennsylvania also need work, so says the national group America First Policy Institute. It insists it's nonpartisan, but its spokesman is a former Trump press secretary and appeared with two conservative state lawmakers. They say counties do not do a good enough job updating its voter rolls when people move or people die. They stopped short of saying people who shouldn't be voting are voting, but they did say this. We're here today in an obvious effort to protect legal votes and legal voters. As the judge said, one vote cast in error, regardless of the reason, negates someone's legitimate vote. We can't allow that to happen. I think that this is a partisan job sowing distrust where there need not be any. We know that our elections here in Pennsylvania are safe, free, and secure. One county election official tells me there are shortcomings known to all and that they've repeatedly asked for legislative fixes, but lawmakers haven't provided them. He also said he is confident people who should not be voting aren't. Well, a new poll in one of Pennsylvania's tightest congressional races shows six-term Republican incumbent Scott Perry in a statistical dead heat with his Democratic challenger, former TV news anchor Janelle Stelson, in the 10th congressional. These are the latest results from Franklin and Marshall College, a pretty big, by the way, 6.1 margin of error, otherwise dead heat. Now, not sure voters will choose Perry, but Speaker of the House Mike Johnson chose him for the House Intelligence Committee, which has oversight of U.S. intelligence agencies, including the FBI, which sees Perry's phone as part of its investigation into attempts to reverse the results of the 2020 election. Perry said he'll offer actual oversight of agencies that, quote, all too often abuse their powers and authority to spy on the American people, end quote. Democrats say Perry's the last person who should get such an appointment. Quote, he's an election denier who is being investigated by the FBI for his involvement of the big lie. Speaking of big lies, police officers who defended the U.S. Capitol on January 6th are frustrated at suggestions that nothing happened that day or it was no big deal, and they blame Donald Trump and his supporters for that narrative. Two of them came to the state capitol Wednesday, stumping for President Biden and calling Trump a threat who must be stopped. It was a political appearance on the front steps, but moments later they went inside the House chamber, welcomed by Democratic Speaker Joanna McClinton. Some House Republicans jeered, some walked out, others applauded. But I asked one of those officers what he says to people who say, Donald Trump didn't participate in the riot, why are you blaming him? Well, guess what? Osama bin Laden didn't fly the planes into the World Trade Center, and yet we convicted him. So my point being is that he incited the, the mob, he pointed the mob, and he told them where to go. And then when the violence happened, he didn't do anything to, to stop it. The officers also tell me they're frustrated at people who watched it on TV and suggest now it was no big deal or that it didn't actually happen. We are joined now by Republican Congressman Dan Muser from Northeastern Pennsylvania, who is the Pennsylvania co-chair of the Trump campaign. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, we're gonna talk more about the campaign and the election after the break, but while we were just talking about those officers, let's, let's address that now with you. You were there that day. We have the picture of you being escorted off the floor by officers, they protected you. Why are they not viewed as heroes by many in the Trump camp? One officer said, vote for who you want, but don't suggest it didn't happen, that that's insulting to them. What's your response to that? Yeah, hi, Dennis. Great being with you. Yes, I was there on the House floor that day. I was one of the last members on the House floor, and that Capitol Police officer pleaded with me to, to, to leave finally, uh, which I did, and you notice we were both ducking. We, we actually thought we were under fire. So it was, it was a very ugly day, um, a day that we've uh, everyone I know has denounced. I don't know who says it's, it was no big deal. No, it was a very big deal. Now, on the same note, it lasted four hours, uh, and there were those that were there for one purpose and one purpose only, and I saw them up real close to create mayhem. They didn't go to attend a rally. Um, many of them did not attend the rally. They didn't listen to what, what uh, President Trump had to say. They came there to create chaos and mayhem and violence in the Capitol. And there were rumors to that effect prior. I mean, I, for instance, told my staff not to come in. Now, regarding these officers, uh, certainly we are very, very grateful for their service. The Capitol Police are really partners to us uh, in Washington. I see them every day. 
uh, see 10, 12, 14 of the same ones every day and, and anyone else. They're there. Uh, they're law enforcement. They certainly should be respected. And we're very grateful for their service. Well, they, now, let same, me ask one, one quick question because we just have a couple of seconds in this block. Uh, they would like a plaque to be put up at the U.S. Capitol remembering that day, January 6th. It was supposed to have been installed March a year ago. Still hasn't. Some of them believe it's House Republicans blocking that. What do you feel about that? Well, let's see what the plaque has to say. And, and, and here's the thing. They came up and gave a stump speech. They came up as Biden surrogates on the Pennsylvania House floor. They gave a campaign speech bashing Trump. Uh, and that's that's their right, but not on the House floor, in my view, and promoting Biden. It was a campaign. And, you know, this is what the Biden campaign is all about. J6 a dubious trial, trial in New York, and lies about Social Security. It's certainly not going to be about but the policy issues of the border, of the energy policy, of inflation, of our economy, of the state of the world that's okay. in close to chaos. We're gonna, you're, you're, you're on a roll. I don't want to stop you. We have to take a commercial break. I do want to point out that the campaign speech was on the front steps of the Capitol. The introduction inside the Capitol was just an introduction and a wave. But stay with us. We're going to talk about the upcoming campaign with Congressman Dan Muser right after this break. This PA Chamber Minute is paid for by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry. The PA Chamber works to make Pennsylvania more competitive. Our advocacy efforts have delivered major returns for the business community over the past several years, resulting in over $31 billion in total savings. This comes out to a savings of nearly $4,825 per employee for businesses of all sizes across all sectors everywhere in Pennsylvania, from preventing harmful tax increases to winning historic victories for small businesses, the PA Chamber is on the front lines of making Pennsylvania more competitive. Every dollar saved is another dollar that can be reinvested in our communities and economy. But we need your help to continue this important work. Visit pachamber.org to find out how you can become a member, get involved in our mission, and start saving today. Welcome back to This Week in Pennsylvania. We are pleased to be joined by Republican Congressman Dan Muser from Northeastern Pennsylvania, basically Lebanon to the New York line. And he's the PA co-chair of the Donald Trump campaign. So convicted on 34 counts, twice impeached, four times indicted. But polls suggest Donald Trump leading in Pennsylvania. Can you explain that? And why are you embracing him, given that litany of things I just mentioned? Well, you know, the trial itself had many dubious factors, as you've uh, clearly have, have known and, and discussed, uh, certainly from, from the judge uh, to the type of witnesses that were permitted to brag in the first place, bragging how he was going to get Trump in his, uh, in his campaign, how this uh, trial was denied a number of times, yet the timing of it is very dubious, highly suspect. Why didn't they do it last year? Why didn't they do it the year before? So there's a lot of factors promoting the fact that it was, with the idea anyway, that it was quite uh, politically motivated. Look, uh, Pennsylvania, like many states, has a lot of Biden buyer's remorse. Biden came in, he was gonna be the uniter, he was gonna be this good guy, he was gonna bring the country together, we were gonna move forward. Anything but has happened. Uh, his policies are a disaster. Uh, from a national security standpoint, our, our border, unmitigated disaster, drugs, you name it, uh, human trafficking, uh, the energy policy uh, causing all kinds of inflation, that and the wildly excessive spending. He's he's been he's been he's been a disaster. Look on the global stage. Um, we've we've got wars, conflicts, uh, whatever you want to call them, real serious problems, and a lot of money going in that direction. So, and what's worse is he says, hey, everything's great. We're going to stay the course. We're going to stay the course. So, no, we need to change course. We need to reverse course. We need President Trump. We need a hard-nosed, America first, tough SOB, frankly, to come in and stop the excessive spending, make uh, Pennsylvania and America energy dominant once again, uh, put, put, uh, bring some world peace, because it's peace through strength, not peace through, through appeasement. Now, and hey, Congressman, and even, close if, the border. E even if Trump wins, he can only serve one term. Did the Republican Party fail in not coming up with some other candidate who almost assuredly would be way ahead of Joe Biden at this point? I like he has four years. Uh, he's uh, he's never been uh, he never owed anyone in the first place. He's going to come in. He's going to uh, he's has a high sense of urgency. He's a great businessman. I don't care what anybody says. 
uh, great business person. I've seen him in his, pre I've worked with him in his presence, how his sense of urgency, his sense of planning, his ability to execute, his ability to get things done, and the influence that he, he will have, I think, over the what will be a Republican House, because we have some great candidates running, and what will be a Republican Senate. And let's watch the results. You know, I love when people yeah. say, oh, he says he's going to be a tyrant. That's made up. That's a lie. What he said is I may be a, a tyrant for one day. He was trying to make a joke, but he's going to hit. You know what his revenge is going to be? His revenge is going to be success. I know and you I, went to the southern border. Is that a big issue for northeastern Pennsylvania or Pennsylvania at all? Oh, my God, Dennis. How about just the other day? We got a report within a five day period. We had 141 overdose deaths for, from some new drug uh, coming out of rhino crate or something coming out from from the border. Yeah, we, we're losing that is literally 100,000 uh, young Americans a year. And it's coming from the border. Go, I've been there four times. Uh, the CBP will be the first to tell you the human trafficking, the death, the cartels getting stronger all the time. Dennis, uh, Mexico is becoming a, a much of a gangland. I don't know if you saw in the last election, there were nearly 50 political um, uh, but politicians that were running, that were anti-cartel, that were murdered. And all this is coming because we allowed the borders to be open and we allowed the cartels to take okay. over and okay. bring the drugs in. Quickly, quickly last, last question. This is going to be a tight race in Pennsylvania. We're less than five months of the election. Just quickly, what's going to decide it in your view? Well, I do think the Biden by remorse. I also think the level of registration. I think it comes down to the people. If re Republicans and independents and Democrats who want to see a corrected course, who want to see improvement, who want to see a strong Pennsylvania and a strong America, I think they're going to come out for Donald Trump. And in some cases, look, they don't like his personality, but the personality comes with the policy. Uh, and on the world stage and here domestically, I, peep, I think right. people are going to realize that, that economically and national security will be strengthened. We need a stronger America. We're going to have to leave it there. But thank you so much for being with us, Congressman Dan Muser. Appreciate it. Stay with us. More This Week in Pennsylvania when we come right back. Well, welcome back to This Week in Pennsylvania. More with our analysts, Christopher Nicholas, Eagle Consulting Group, Brittany Cramsey, Britt Cramsey Communications. How big of a partisan pit have we fallen into when we can't uh, cheer law enforcement who were protecting the Capitol on January 6th uh, universally and bipartisanly? What does that say about us? Sure. Well, not only did they not cheer, they walked out on these law Some enforcement did, yes, yes. officers. Some jeered as well, as we reported. <laughs> a whole host of disgusting behavior from Republicans on the House floor here. Whether you are voting for Biden or not, these law enforcement officers were sworn to protect the Capitol. Their lives were in danger based on what happened in January 6th. So to not have honored <clears throat> their sacrifice, the sacrifice of their families. Imagine their families on the day of January 6th, seeing what was happening on the news, and then to be treated this way on the PA House floor. It's just, it's gross. I think it is above and beyond politics. They didn't have to go to the Biden rally outside, but they should have honored the law enforcement officers on the floor. I think it's too bad that a very few House Republicans did that. I'm glad that the Republican House leader, Brian Cutler, not only applauded them, but also got his picture taken mm -hmm. with them in the moments afterwards. Uh, I think this issue is in general way overblown. Uh, and, um, you know, the Democrats had a fundraiser with these folks and a press conference and then this. So, you know, they had a good hit out of it. But uh, I think it was a very small number of Republicans who, let me be clear, shouldn't have done that. You know, if you don't like someone like that, just uh, be quiet. You don't have to, you know, yell. But I think what we're talking about is a pattern of behavior. For generations now, Republicans have called themselves the law and order party. You know, they're big on criminal justice. However, the leader of their party was convicted on 34 counts last week, and they say, not such a big deal, not a problem. They laud law enforcement, or they used to, and now you bring in law enforcement officers and they jeer them. So is this the law and order pro-criminal justice party or not? I think they're having an identity problem as well as a partisanship problem. Says the member of the party who gone out of their way for years to defund uh, the police. So I think there's a lot of uh, ground to cover in that particular As issue. I mentioned, though, everything, people, if you listen to nothing I say, <laughs> everything is political between now and Election Day. It was, they were brought in by Biden-Harris. Correct. Uh, Democrats knew what they were doing with the timing of this. 
Republicans, I've heard say they should weren't smart enough to not take the bait. Some of them did. It's more of a Broadway show now with Joanna McClinton running the House than it is an actual operating legislative chamber. Well, I think they've actually passed dozens of yep. bills that the Republican Senate has refused to pass because here. It is bills. the first week of June. We have five more months of this. It's not like it was an October weekend. We have to take ah. a commercial. Stay with us. Much more when we come right back. Franklin and Marshall College poll out this week. You see it there, the 10th Congressional, which is Harrisburg, York, and its suburbs. Uh, Scott Perry, six-term incumbent in a statistical dead heat with uh, former TV news anchor this woman This is a fascinating Janelle poll. Stelson. Yeah, because 11% still don't know or undecided. No, and no, well, not because of that. This was a real-life A-B split right in front of our faces. That poll, not, no fault of theirs, happened to be in the field when the verdict came down. So, they so it was were, before the verdict and then post verdict. Yeah, so the Franklin Marshall folks, in a good way, put it out. So there was a 15 point swing, I ran the numbers beforehand, between before the verdict and afterwards, between where Perry was. So Perry basically went down 10 and Stelson went up five when that verdict came down. And if the poll had been taken more after the verdict, the numbers would have been inverted, but again, just their schedule, you know, there it was. So that to me is very interesting. It was a bigger swing than the Trump-Biden numbers in the same poll. So what I wanna know is down ballot Republican races, are they gonna be harmed by this just for a couple of days? Or is this kind of, a, you know, retrenching what the numbers are? Because no one's really talked about how the Trump trial numbers impact every other Republican and Democrat on the ballot. It's all been focused on Trump and Biden. Well, I think we can talk about it now. We're seeing that voters are fed up with Trump down the ballot. You know, they are sick of Donald Trump. They're sick Trump's of his... Trump's ahead in this poll, so I don't know if the poll, they're 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 Trump's up defendants. by five he in that poll, and I was going to ask, is that bad news for Perry, that Trump is up in that district, but he's kind of in a tie. They've swapped, so it's extra bad news for Perry, but Trump can't be liking the trend that he's seeing here. So in the last cycle, uh, when... Perry was on the presidential year, there were a lot of Biden-Perry voters. I don't think we're going to see a lot of Biden-Perry voters this time. I think you're going to see a lot of Biden. Voters? <laughs> Let, no, I think you're going to see a really? lot of... <laughs> I don't think we're going to see Our any... Dems are going to be consistent I down the ballot I think these two here. races are going to be tied at the hip. I don't think there's going to be a big difference percentage-wise between what the presidential folks get and what the congressional... But bottom line, get. Stelson's got a shot. Well, yeah, she doesn't live in the district, but she has a shot. <laughs> Five months yeah. out and she's tied. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. <laughs> uh, sure hope to see you next week on This Week.